My name is Lee Janko. I'm a professor of political theory here at the London School of Economics. Um, and I am here to welcome you all to this session of the Epistemic Urgency of Conceptual Diversity Workshop. I will be introducing our speakers and keeping time. And then at the end, we will have time for questions. I wanna remind everyone that accessibility has been a priority at all stages of planning of this workshop. Live captions will be provided throughout and speakers texts will also be available on our website. Live interpretation to and from Spanish will be available throughout the two days. This is to enable one of our speakers to participate fully in all parts of the workshop. If all of our speakers are with us now, I believe we're gonna start with Humera Iktidar. Um, this is a little bit out of order than what you might see on your program, but this is because Humera has um, a, another engagement. She's double booked because that's just how popular she is. Um, so let me introduce uh, Humera. Should I introduce everyone all at once or should I introduce them as we give our talk? What has been the, the, the practice here? All at once is a good idea, Lee. And then okay, I'll just, so I, there, we have four panelists today and I'll be introducing all of them at once. And then we're gonna be starting with Humera and I'll be introducing them in the order in which we'll be hearing our papers. I should um, let all of you know, I am not a native speaker of Spanish or German or many of the other languages that might be uh, required to pronounce um, everyone's name correctly today. I, I actually, study Chinese, Mandarin Chinese, um, but I don't see any uh, Chinese speakers in this in this panel. So I might I might make some mistakes. If, if you want me to correct the pronunciation of your name or your affiliation or anything else, um, just interrupt me and let me know because um, we're still all learning here. Uh, so let me first start off by introducing Humera Iktadar, who's gonna be delivering a paper today called Diversifying Justice. Humera joined King's College London in 2011 she has studied at the University of Cambridge, McGill University in Canada, and Qaeda Azam University in Pakistan. Before joining King's, Humera was based at the University of Cambridge as a fellow of King's College and the Center for Southeast Asian, or sorry, sorry for South Asian Studies. She is a co-convener with me, I might add, of the London Comparative Political Theory Workshop, as well as uh, Rochna Bajpayat, so as many of you may know. And she is editor of the McGill Queen Studies in Modern Islamic Thought. She does that on her own. I don't know anything about Islamic thought. Humanity's research interests bring together post-colonial theory and comparative political theory with a focus on modern South Asian Islamic thought. Our next speaker is M.A. Ayelan Pagnanelli. Is that somewhat correct? Yes, that's fine. It's Ashilen, but that's, that's good. Ashilen? Okay. I'm, I'm really sorry. I, again, um, I'm, I'm doing my best. Uh, I, Hélène Pagnanelli is a doctoral fellow at Consejo Nacional de Investigaciones Científicas uh, y Técnicas and a PhD candidate examining gender and sexuality in the abstract art scenes of, in Buenos Aires from 1937 to 1963 at the Centro de Investigaciones en Arte y Patrimonio UNSAM. Pagnanelli holds an MA in Argentine and Latin American art history from Instituto de Altos Estudiales Sociales, Universidad Nacional de San Martín, and a BA in Gender Studies and Studio Art from Skidmore College. Pagnanelli has been awarded a Princeton University Libraries grant for the year 2020-2021. Our third speaker is Constance Awenpoka Akuruku. Is that, Constance, is that even close to being correct? Yes, that's very perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thank you, Constance. Okay. Constance will be presenting her work on writing in the mother tongue towards decolonizing knowledge production in Northern Ghana. Constance is lecturer in the Faculty of Planning and Land Management, Simon Diodong Dombo University of Business and Integrated Development Studies. She is a gender activist and theorist. She obtained a PhD in sociology from the Newcastle University in the United Kingdom. Her research focuses on gender relations of power, women's empowerment theory and practice, and feminist postcolonial and decolonial theories. She is also interested in the mystical world of the ethnicities in Northern Ghana and the way in which the pervasiveness of the belief in the existence of other than human beings complicates agency and resistance practices. That sounds like a very interesting research agenda. Constantly. 
Um, our final and fourth speaker is Usma Falak. Is that right, Usma? Oh, good enough. Okay, thank you. Um, who will be speaking on, will this be written down too as history, exploring people's iterations, itineraries, and praxis of liberation in Kashmir through concepts of Zulm, Insaf, Asadi, and Giestoen, female friendship. So Zulm is oppression, Insaf is justice, Asadi, freedom, and Vestion, female friendship. And I apologize if I got those pronunciations wrong, but um, Usma will tell us how to do it uh, when she gives her talk. So Usma is a DAAD doctoral fellow at the University of Heidelberg, where she is pursuing her PhD in anthropology. Her poetry, essays, and reportage have appeared in the Baffler magazine, Adi magazine, Al Jazeera English, Warscape, The Caravan, Himal, South Asian, Kindle magazine, Jadalia, Anthropology and Humanism, The Economic and Political Weekly, Himalaya Journal, The Electronic Intifada, The Palestinian Chronicle, including anthologies and collections like Gossamer, an anthology of contemporary world poetry, of occupation and resistance, writings from Kashmir, Cups of Nunchai, among others. She won an honorable mention in the Society for Humanistic Anthropology's Ethnographic Poetry Award in 2017. She was also an invited artist scholar at the 2018 Warwick Tate Exchange held at the Tate Modern. Her documentary, Till Then the Roads Carry Her, has been screened at the Second Annual Memory Studies Association Conference, University of Copenhagen, the 24th European Conference on South Asian Studies at the University of Warsaw, um, Karl Stolk Kino, Heidelberg, Tate Modern, London, Synod Diaspora Film Festival in New York, 12th IAWRT Asian Women Film Festival in New Delhi, among others. So I extend a warm welcome to all of our speakers um, thank you for presenting your work. I thank you in advance for presenting your work. I will be timing you. You'll each have 10 minutes. We're going to start with Humera Iktidar speaking on diversifying justice. Humera, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Lee, and thank you to the to the part, to the um, organizers for this wonderful conversation through the morning uh, that I've been following. Um, wonderful. Uh, I am sorry that I will have to leave um, earlier than I had uh, originally planned. Uh, I am also going to be slightly shameless and plug the seminar that I am. I, I need to go and um, and spend some time at uh, that I co-convene with a colleague in South Africa um, and in Pakistan. It's a it's an online seminar on race and racism in the global south. Um, and it runs uh, every two weeks. Um, so uh, it is my loss. I will miss the discussion. Uh, any questions you have, please direct them to Lee because Lee will answer them on my behalf. <laughs> Keep in mind, I know nothing of the topic, but I will make my, yeah. uh, my best effort to answer all of the questions fully next. <laughs> well, you know, I, my, I'm going to, I'm going to say, Lee, that um, I found your work to be really productive in, in thinking through my own questions as well. So, uh, you can, you can answer some of those questions. Um, so, let me. I am going to read in the interest of time, um, and and let me start with the with that then. Uh, I guess the first thing to do is to really place my comments today within my overall research interests. Um, I focus on modern Islamic and South Asian thought and practice to work through not just the limits of Eurocentric theorizing, but also alternatives to it. So the task, I think, is not just to critique, but also to move beyond critique to engaging seriously with alternatives, their potentials and their limitations. This does not, of course, mean a search for some native authentic tradition that is out there with ready answers. Rather, um, as I've argued in a recent research about the challenges of decolonizing political theory, decolonizing, I think, inevitably involves a creative reworking across traditions of thought to build a new conceptual repertoire. So here I think the challenge for many of us on the left end of the political spectrum is that, is that while we make the case for inclusion and engagement with other traditions of thought or other modes of being, we spend much less time thinking about the precise ways in which our own assumptions about what politics might be, how resistance can be recognized, how society should be organized, how all our, our own assumptions will be challenged. 
Um, and quite a few of us, I mean, just thinking through some of the things that have come up already, quite a few of us have mentioned neoliberalism through the morning. But to my mind, many of the problems we see in our universities and in knowledge production uh, processes predate neoliberalism. Um, you know, in many ways, they are products of liberal orders. And I think it is to liberalism that we need to think of, uh, we need to think about more cogent alternatives um, uh, that need to be crafted. So a fundamental question that has already arisen in conversations in the morning is who and what is knowledge production for in our universities? Um, in other work, I've argued that in the Islamic tradition, this question is very much at the forefront. It's a constant, it's, it's something that is constantly and explicitly uh, debated uh, on an ongoing basis. Who are the producers of knowledge? Why should they produce it? Who are the consumers of knowledge and why should they consume it? These are important questions that I think, you know, just in terms of the questions that, that we can take from other traditions to also uh, continue to inform our work. Um, I think these are important questions to keep in mind as we go through uh, the conversation today and tomorrow. Now, as these questions might indicate, the normative element is clearly center stage in the Islamic tradition. And one important value that plays a central role uh, in the Islamic tradition, but also many other traditions is of justice. Justice is a central concept in Islamic thought as in uh, most contemporary movements and mobilizations of resistance in South Asia. Today, I will focus on an important element of justice in South Asian and Islamic thought by building on now about eight year long research with migrants and refugees from the tribal areas of Pakistan who had to flee their homes as a result of the still ongoing war in Afghanistan and relatedly Pakistan. And you know, here in London, we often tend to forget that that war is still ongoing. It is a war that uh, some of the richest and most powerful countries in the world waged on one of the poorest countries in the world. And even though uh, the, you know, the rich and the poor have lost that war, the war still grinds on and its repercussions still continue to ripple through these communities that I uh, engage with. Now I approach the much wider concept of justice today through a focus on the notion of haq that cam, came up in, uh, in a lot of my conversations. It's a, it's, a, it's a concept that, you know, many of my interlocutors bring up constantly. And haq is often translated as right, and that is correct, that is not incorrect at least. But I argue that it is much more than a right, and certainly much more than a legal right. Let me, in the interest of time, then state rather boldly, the two arguments I want to make. First, that the frequent translation of Huck as right hides from view the wider and much more capacious visions of Huck that animated, animate ongoing debates within Islamic thought and movements of resistance. And secondly, an important implication of this capaciousness is that it raises very uncomfortable questions regarding alternatives to legal rights as means of providing justice. So let me explain these arguments through examples to flesh them out a little bit. In my interviews and conversations, my interlocutors harness very different visions of Huck. They might say, and I'm quoting, all we want is peace and justice in South. This is our Huck, but also the Huck of the government or the state. Or they might say, we are on Huck and therefore we have nothing to fear or to quote uh, another frequent uh, uh, form formulation, we were refugees. It was the huck of our fellow citizens in Lahore to look after us. If they fail to do so properly, that is their loss. Um, and finally, you know, the, you know, one of the more kind of uh, easily accessible versions of huck, are we not citizens of Pakistan? Do we not have the huck to ask for proper roads and schools in our area? So as these quotes might show, there are multiple uh, visions of Huck at play here. This is Huck as a moral and social right, Huck as truth, Huck as moral and social obligation that arises from the acknowledgement of truth, and then Huck also as political and in some cases legal right. Now, I think what is quite interesting and one part that I can focus on given um, our time constraints um, 
what is quite interesting is that Huck in this formulation belongs to the oppressor as much as to the oppressed. So for instance, uh, in the quote that I uh, mentioned earlier, the huck of the government in the context of a conversation where the refugees blame the government for their dislocation because the government of Pakistan decided to side uh, with America that started a war. Et so there's a lot of blame that, and then you know the various army attacks that went on in the tribal areas, the Pakistani army um, and its various operations in the tribal areas. So there's a lot of blame towards the government and towards the army, but it is, uh, but they will also say that it was the huck of the army to do X and Y or to not do X and Y. Or similarly, when they talk about the haq of the hosts in Lahore who failed to host properly and failed to look after the refugees. So clearly now we are moving into ideas about justice and rights that are more expensive than liberal rights for sure. And so they move beyond the focus on individual right to incorporate in collective concerns and Sumi has, uh, has a really fabulous piece about that. Um, uh, they also move beyond status legality in liberal rights regimes and institutional limitations of liberal rights regimes. Um, and in the longer version of the paper, I, I discuss these in more detail. Um, but here I just want to highlight that when we start thinking about justice and what justice might look like, if it is to include these expanded visions of Huck within existing states and legal regimes, we run into, uh, into a problem. For most of the 19th and 20th century, political and social mobilizations have aimed to redress concerns around justice by expanding the rights afforded to different segments of society. So to women, to differently abled individuals, to workers, et cetera, et cetera. Shimena, sorry, you have about 30 seconds left. Okay, thank you. So the substantive concerns of the rights have deferred, but the rights, but rights have been used most heavily as a mechanism for supporting just arrangements in society. Um, so, uh, so I can only end with a suggestion here about the importance of imagining futures that take us beyond rights and a caution about the difficulty of doing so. To recognize this difficulty is not to argue for abandoning the project, rather it is a call for taking seriously the challenge as well as the opportunity for a, for a fundamental transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for keeping to time. I'm sorry to rudely interrupt, but on a Zoom call, I wasn't sure if I should gesture wildly with my hands, that wasn't working, so I will just interrupt people and tell them if you have a minute left. So the rest of you, um, Thanks. I hope you're aware that this is what um, this is what will be happening. Um, I have suddenly lost my other note um, telling me. Sorry, I lost my list of panelists. This isn't supposed to happen. I'm supposed to be much more prepared than this, but for some reason, let me call it up on my phone. Was it Eileen for uh, next? Um, let me see. Um, the next person is um, a Aileen, the person whose name I think I've been consistently mispronouncing, Aileen Pagnanelli, who will be speaking on Mariposeo and Guantabo, reframing male sexuality in 1940s Buenos Aires. Aileen? Hi, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so I will share my screen. Let me, I don't seem to have that option available for me. And if Isabel or Sumi can help me out with that. Intenta ahora. A ver. Yes. Okay. I will see my screen now. Yes, it's loading, but yes, it looks, yes, yeah, it looks like okay. it's your screen now. Perfect. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. I first wanted to thank LSC and the Department of Gender Studies for organizing this wonderful event. I woke up very early <laughs> to start watching it. Um, I would like to begin by showing you these images of an art opening 
from 1949 in Buenos Aires, Argentina. A highly cosmopolitan city, Fosfor Buenos Aires was the home of many. Is everything okay? okay. A highly cosmopolitan city, Fosfor Buenos Aires was the home of many Europeans that sought refuge from the Spanish Civil War and World War II. Many of them partook in the modern art scene. As part of my doctoral dissertation, I am looking into issues of gender and sexuality in the modern and abstract art scenes in Buenos Aires from the late 1930s to early 1960s. Hierarchies built on the basis of gender and sexuality were present and operating at these scenes. When conducting research in Buenos Aires in decades of 1940 and 1950, it has been key to move away from the concept of male homosexuality. It is crucial to bear in mind that in those decades, the configuration of sexual subjectivities, identities, and practices were understood in different ways than today. There is a growing field of studies dedicated to research this, which unfortunately falls outside the scope of this presentation to detail. Terms like homosexuality do not even begin to portray the array of practices which occurred at the time. Gender theories created in the global north remain the predominant tools for analysis of gender and sexualized social dynamics for researchers working in Latin America. The concepts generally used to theorize sexuality are not nuanced enough and cannot grasp the complexities of gender, sexuality, and its practices in 1940s Buenos Aires. The images in this slide contain drawings that show the attire worn by upper class ladies at an opening at the Institute of Modern Art. The photographs display how modern art hangs on the walls. Men and women are celebrating it. The men have carefully combed hair, are engaging in conversation and laughter free. In one image, a man even casually poses for the cameras. This was Marcelo de Rida who came from a European family of collectors and whose inheritance he used to found the Institute of Modern Art in July, 1949. With the Institute of Modern Art, the reader set out to contribute to the local artistic scene. He was both its director and coordinator of the visual arts area. The reader was one of the men that were significant players in the modern art scene and whose gender and sexuality likely escaped outside the heterosexual matrix. I think someone, someone else has their mic on. I don't know if that can be muted. Um, but anyway, so that be that embodied this dandy homosexual stereotype of the upper classes, a man associated with the arts, with elegance and the newer mind that was sometimes sexually involved with other men. This vague dandy stereotype was the way by which these figures, generally rich and close to the art world, were framed. In the mid 1950s, Derrida began a relationship with Marcos Curi that lasted until his death in an accident in 1973. We can say with some certainty that it was likely that Derrida was romantically or sexually involved with other men prior to that relationship. It is theorizing over the practices of men like Derrida that have pushed me to find concepts beyond male homosexuality. I propose thinking in terms of Mariposé and Guantado to begin to undust some of the characteristics of male queer practices in Buenos Aires in this period and this socioeconomic group. Translated as hidden limp twisted coquetry, it is a native category of 1940s Argentina. It appears in a review of an opening of the Institute of Modern Art published by a Peronist newspaper in 1950. The review was very negative and likely contributed to the closing of the Institute of Modern Art in 1952 and the reader's exile of Argentina. As one fragment said, and I thank Julia Sanchez for her wonderful translation of this complex passage, those ostentatious gallery openings on the other hand, conducted in an environment of hidden limb twisted coquetry, have merited no other response from the city than a good humor chuckle, if not full valid taunting. And I end quote. The review points to how the city was not only aware of the queerness at the Institute of Modern Art, but it was outright condemning it. 
Mariposa and Guantado hint at the complex task of conceptualizing male practices for this period in Buenos Aires. Here, male same-sex desire was collapsed with feminized male bodies. The global North's concept of sexual orientation and sexual identity, rather than being separate, are entangled here. The first part of the expression, mariposeo, refers to a certain free, feminized body movement that should not appear in the body repertoire of heterosexual men. It speaks of the effeminate practices of upper-class men that were not overt cross-dressing or travestism of the members of the popular classes. Mariposeo points to more subtle gestures that, however, did not go unnoticed by their peers. Mariposeo indicates both a certain feminization and a desire for other men, gender identity and sexual orientation converge in it. In turn, mariposeo is an action. It is neither a characteristic nor an identity. Following Jude Butler's emphasis on the performativity of gender and how gendered identities are constructed from the reiteration of naturalized acts in a body and discursive scripts, it becomes relevant that mariposeo is a verb. The action described by Mariposeo is one that shows a divergence from the heterosexual matrix. Therefore, using Mariposeo to think about these practices allows us to account for subtle ways of breaking the heteronorm by men of this modern art scene and from a certain socioeconomic group. On the other hand, in Guantado, the second part of the expression relates to the hidden social practices that define queer lives throughout most of the 20th century. It speaks about the closet. Closet, as Kosovsky said with its epistemological concept, as the structure that defined gay oppression in the last century, that separated the secret from the said, the private from the public. Closet does not appear in this period as a word or concept used in Argentina. The enguantado, as the hidden, alludes to how those queer social practices were built in silence without being overtly visible that described the lives of those who lived outside the heterosexual matrix in 1940s and 1950s Buenos Aires. Mariposa and Guantado becomes a metaphor from which to account for the specificities of gender and sexuality in the modern art scene in Buenos Aires. A negative expression Mariposa and Montado encapsulates both a moment of escape from heteronormativity as well as the taboo from homosexuality in Buenos Aires then. Most importantly, it does so in ways that homosexuality, as understood in the English speaking world, failed to grasp. It allows us to make visible some of the challenges researchers face when setting what those practices look like. Mariposa and Guantado can become a useful category from which to account for the nuances of gender and sexuality in Latin America prior to the 1970s. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. I was about to say you had one minute left, but you managed to, uh, you managed to finish. I realize my video isn't on, sorry about that. I think that's a new record. I don't think I've ever been at a conference for so much, actually finished on time or even before time. So thank you very much for an interesting talk and for being so timely. Our next speaker is Constance Alampoca Agurugu, who's going to be speaking on writing in the mother tongue towards decolonizing knowledge production in Northern Ghana. Constance, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, I am very grateful to the organizers of this program for putting this together, I've already learned a lot. So I um, want to talk to you about uh, some of my own research experiences here in uh, Northern um, Ghana. So I just, I want to show to you the outline of my presentation whilst I proceed, thank you. So um, as many uh, uh, speakers have already alluded to, um, researchers working in a post-colonial settings like Northern Ghana often encounter challenges on a daily basis. We engage in multiple languages. Um, for instance, uh, in the specific uh, context of my research, I engage with three different languages. Fafra, my native language spoken in the northeastern part of Ghana. Um, the Gare, which is a dominant language in the north 
western part of Ghana where I'm based and do my ethnography and of course the English language which is supposed to be our um, lingua um, franca. So there are challenges um, in uh, representing and communicating our ideas, drawing on these western and uh, uh, I mean American and Eurocentric um, concepts and epistemology of knowing because uh, in many instances they just fail to represent adequately the nuances and the rich uh, cultural diversity and meanings of um, these um, indigenous um, cultural groups. So in this presentation, I reflect on uh, some of my research experiences and the challenges that uh, I encounter and many people uh, in play, uh, who do research like I do encounter in trying to communicate uh, indigenous people's ideas and thoughts to uh, a predominantly Western uh, audience, but also Westernized um, African um, audiences. And I do this drawing on my ethnography amongst the Dagaba people of Northwestern um, Ghana. And the Dagaba people have enjoyed a lot of uh, ethnographic fame. And actually, Sean Hawkins um, describes it, the Gaba people as a, a, a minor ethnographic celebrities made famous by a British um, anthropologist. And he's referring to Jack um, Goody here. I also reflect on what it might mean to write in ways that adequately represent the nuances um, of these um, cultural groups, and also what it has meant um, for writing about these people in languages other than the indigenous languages. And some of the implications have included uh, reinforcing and privileging uh, dominant Western ways of knowing and also um, concepts. So the predominance of Western epistemologies as the lenses through which we read the lived experiences of African people has not been without consequences at all. In many instances, uh, African people's lived experiences, cultural practices have been misrepresented, uh, they have been rendered invisible, and they have actually been uh, denigrated in some instances. In the specific case of the Dagaba people in Northwestern Ghana, some of such violations can be found in the work of the eminent British um, anthropologist, uh, Jack Goody. So Jack Goody studied in this group um, around the 1950s, actually earlier from 1930s to 1950s, and he's written extensively about the so-called Lo Daga. This is how um, he called them. So after several challenges and attempts and an inability on his part to fully understand the complexities that characterize the identities of his ethnographic subjects, he coined neologisms, including the Lo Daga, Lo Willy, Lo Brifo, to designate these people who mostly identify after their natal settlements. So if you go uh, to any of these communities, you are unlikely to find any group of people who go by these designations that uh, Jack Goody and uh, other um, scholars have appropriated. So uh, another uh, misrepresentation is found in the works of the historian Sean Hawkins. So Sean Hawkins argues that marriage as a concept as the early missionaries and also earlier local or indigenous anthropologists used, it's non-existent. It was not part of the cultures of these people until contact with the colonial administrators. Uh, Hawkins argues that what used to pertain in these areas is just conjugal practices. And for the ethnographic participants that I worked with, this is quite unthinkable to even conceive, to think that there was no marriage because it is a grave disrespect to the sacred institution of marriage. For the Dagaba people that I worked with, marriage is a union that brings communities together and families together as well. And this has always been an important cultural value uh, in this um, area. So for Hawkins and for other uh, researchers who misread this, the complex processes that uh, govern marriage practices in this area, for me, the issue is simple. It is because uh, there are usual cultural repertoires and the concepts that uh, Western dominant epistemologies enable or make available to them do not capture the complexities that are associated with these um, practices. 
This is because for me, uh, as an, an um, ethnographer who has worked in this area, uh, marriage and many Dagaba and Northern Ghanaian cultural practices are for very careful, culturally informed observers. So without that careful reading, you are unlikely to uh, be able to appreciate and understand the cultural uh, practices and the norms as they obtain in um, these areas. So in the ethnography that I draw on, I uh, similarly encountered challenges as to how to um, effectively uh, capture and represent the poetics of the Dagare language, which is the language of the Dagaba people. And I just want to use the Dagaba conception of womanhood uh, to demonstrate the kinds of challenges and the limitations of uh, uh, Western centric uh, concepts and ways of knowing in this um, context. So the Dagari term for woman is poor, which literally translates as cover or back cover. So the idea is that the woman is the cover. She provides protection for the husband and also plays a complementary role, role in um, the marriage. But it is very a, a very uh, extensive or capacious um, concept in this area. To talk of woman already is to talk of a good woman. For instance, with, without the kind of uh, qualification that we require in the English language, like say a good woman or a bad woman, to already talk of a woman is to uh, refer to a good woman. There are also other uh, concepts like the pormenga, which I uh, translate as the ideal woman, because if you look at the features that one needs to embody um, to, uh, uh, to be referred or to qualify as a pormenga, it is almost impossible. So I refer to this as um, the ideal woman. There's also the porganda, which is a, a hyperbolic designation that um, the Dagaba people use to refer to strong-willed women who are believed to perform the agenda in ways that uh, um, transgress normative um, expectations of femininity and womanhood um, in uh, this context. So each of these categories, the poro, the poromenga, the porogandao, all come with specific characterizations. And for me, um, they are quite performative in the sense that one woman can be seen um, as a poromenga by uh, one evaluator and as a pogandao, a willful or a woman more than a man um, by another um, evaluator. So these kinds of categorizations and the deep-seated meanings that the Legaba people uh, attach to the notion of womanhood is one instantiation of the challenges that are associated with thinking and writing in multiple languages and in languages uh, that are different from the ones through which the cultures are um, expressed. But um, I also- Sorry, you have, uh, you have less than one minute left. Sorry, oh, I'm sorry okay. to interrupt you. Thank you very much. So I return to uh, uh, my concluding thoughts now, because I think there are also prospects uh, to decolonize knowledge production uh, in this context. And a major challenge for us is that we are a country of very diverse people, and this also applies to many African um, countries. So to talk of uh, having a national language uh, will be a big challenge. But for me, what is important is that we can uh, project um, indigenous cultures and uh, indigenous ways of knowing by drawing on indigenous concepts, recognizing that our wealth as Africans are intricately linked with the wealth of the uh, other than humans, such as uh, the wealth of the, the spirits of um, our ancestors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Constance. Um, that was also very well done for keeping to time with a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers for a lot of really interesting things to think about, not just individually and separately as you're in your presentations, but also across all four papers, which um, I think is one of the benefits of this. Sorry, benefits of this conference. That was my timer going off. Um, so I think at this point we have um, we have about 35 minutes for questions, um, and those have to be submitted in the Q&A. Um, those will be typed in, and um, I think myself or Lily will be reading them out um, for our panelists to 
answer. Um, Aaron, go ahead. Yes, Scott, I would like to, I was thinking about something you said, Usma, about how um, people have their relations about what they do. Um, so I, I was hoping you could speak a little bit about how is it that we can incorporate those uh, theorizations when they don't fit the concepts that we have for them? Uh, Usma, you're muted. You're muted, Usma. Uh, can you repeat the last part? Because I think I lost the connection. Oh, yes. So how, you know, have, have you given more thought about how is it that we can try to incorporate those theorizations uh, from the everyday when they don't fit the concepts that we have for them. Yes. Would you like to respond to Aidan's question? Okay. Yeah. So um, um, similar to Uzma, uh, my own research here in uh, Northern Ghana actually focuses on the limits of this um, Euro and American centric um, notions and theories. So um, what I do in my own research is to um, focus on the limitations and also what the specific um, context and the kinds of performative practices enabled by these contexts uh, can let us understand um, and theorize about the lives of um, um, these kind of people. In uh, Sumi's um, own work in uh, Rajasthan, I've read uh, about uh, the, the concept of the settings and how they might sit uncomfortably with a uh, dominant and a uh, neoliberal um, assumptions and notions of um, development. Similar to uh, the kind of uh, the context that I work in, which Sumi describes as a um, notably oppressive because uh, there are constraining um, conditions that mean that uh, dominant Western assumptions regarding uh, the exercise of power and agency are constrained. What I do, like uh, Osma, is also to um, analyze um, women's songs in spaces that are considered as a uh, women only spaces and to study um, women's struggles and their uh, hidden transcript in a, a Scots terms uh, that, uh, other, that otherwise uh, will not um, be revealed if we were not to pay attention to these kind of secreted um, settings that allow for women to um, express themselves in ways that, uh, um, for instance, show the limits of uh, Western uh, or uh, Euro-American uh, notions of um, agency as expressive uh, ways of um, performing actions. Can I um can I jump in and like maybe respond to Aylan's question because I actually thought you were asking something uh, similar but slightly different. I, I kind of interpreted mm -hmm. your question, Aylan, as, as being not just okay. We have this like body of special concepts that we get from like Europeanized academic discourse that we then find we can't readily translate into our um, ethnographic present, but rather you're asking also about the bottom-up approach. And I, and I think our, our speakers were talking about that as well. Like the, you, you encounter this, this world in your um, examination um, through ethnography or through listening to people or talking to people. And then the question is, um, are, are these people offering these, these grassroots forms of theorizing that you then have trouble bringing up to the level of generalizable theory, right? Um, and this is something it, 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 I just wanted to note, I mean, in my own work, which is on um, actually late imperial Chinese intellectual history, ideas thought, thinking about how people at that time understood and conceptualized difference in Chinese terms, right? So, so much of this has also been overlaid with Western social science categories like race or culture that didn't really exist conceptually, um, you know, in the 15th, 16th, 17th century in China. Um, and I just wanted to note that it actually happens even for very long established literate academic cultures like that of, of um, the Sinophone world, you still end up having the same problem of, of trying to figure out how these things translate into academic theory or theory that we could transplant elsewhere, right? Um, and, and appropriately for this, uh, Sumi um, has just messaged a question. 
She said, I'd love to hear from panelists their reflections on the challenges of translating between different literal and conceptual languages, which gets right at the heart of this, um, this workshop. So um, Aylin, since you sort of started us off with a question, maybe you would like to be the first to respond to this one. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to hear from, from all of you about this. Yes, I cannot see the question, but yes, sure, for, for me, and this is also why I wanted to ask other panelists the question, um, I think breaking away from thinking about sexual orientation and um, sexual identity or gender identity in uh, thinking about gender, particularly when one thinks about history, right, like you're not actually asking people who are like, who can have work that can speak to you, uh, is very challenging. Um, so thank you, uh, Lee, for sharing that his historical so approach because I think it adds like an extra layer of challenge when obviously it's people kind of speak. Um, so uh, you can see the question now. Um, I think that for me the biggest challenge um, translating this one obviously is that even though right Mariposa Guantado is a concept that is no longer used in Argentina currently. So mariposeo, yes, uh, mariposear is a verb that also still uh, speaks to men being effeminate in one way or another. It can even be a term that is sometimes used for bullying young kids. So that some aspect of that still lingers in current um, speak. Um, but then they went out, you know, I had to ask other people, I had to ask my mother, what did she think it meant? I had to ask a professional translator that is a friend of mine to help me translate that into English. Um, so it was, um, it, 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 has, it has many, many challenges. And I still, I say, I'm still not sure whether thinking with this concept is the best, but uh, a lot of the, the theorizing on male homosexuality for Argentina has also been focused on popular classes uh, because a lot of the press material perhaps comes from there. Uh, but as an art historian, I'm looking at uh, very rich people in general at this time uh, being active in that scene. You know, this man actually founded what he thought to be a very important institute that had a very short life. Um, so it's a very different like, group of people uh, because of class as well. Um, so it's also challenging to try to take a concept that was used for the popular classes and translate it with two people who had um, just different lives. So yeah, sorry, I spoke a lot. <laughs> no, it's interesting because there's so many different layers of translation. There's like translation across social statuses, there's translation across time, there's translation across space, there's translation across different kinds of languages that we use in different kinds of spaces. So <clears throat> I think it's just to say we have our work cut out for us. Um, do, do Constance or Usma, do you want to weigh in on this translation question? Um, could you repeat that again? Yes, sure. So this is from Sumi, our brave leader. Um, Sumi is asking, I'd love to hear from panelists their reflections on the challenges of translating between different literal and conceptual languages. Right, yeah. So um, I touched on a bit of this in uh, my presentation because uh, I am particularly placed in a challenging um, situation because the languages, our country is a multi-ethnic um, country with different languages. When you say this, um, sometimes uh, people who are not uh, Ghanian say that, do you mean dialects? And I say, no, these are unique languages. And also this is because of how uh, the demarcations were done uh, during uh, uh, the uh, colonial uh, times. So uh, different people from different groups in, groups have been uh, regrouped. So uh, we, we have languages, we have about over 60 uh, languages in this country. In the north of Ghana, I think there are more than 30 languages. And this makes it difficult because we don't even have softwares that uh, you can even rely on at the minimum before you now work with uh, other aspects. So um, what I have done in my ethnography is to work with two to three um, interpreters for um, my research. So often I will check, um, because I speak some level of Dagari myself, 
I come from the uh, Northeast, as I have said, but I have lived and worked here for over a decade. My husband comes from this place. And so I speak uh, some of the language, just the functional one. So normally I will do my own transcription at uh, the first level. And then I will uh, uh, look for experts who have studied the gallery either at the university or at some advanced level and compare different um, interpretations and also cross-check with other uh, key informants, people who are knowledgeable in the language and who also um, understand English. In terms of concepts, it is actually the challenges uh, involved in understanding or um, in the whole idea or concept of uh, femininity. That led me to begin to say, maybe there is just no single word in the Dagari sense that can capture uh, the English equivalent of woman. So I started to think about this. This is what made me think that, I think in this context, we should think about femininity instead of as one category, um, as something that constitutes a continuum, a range where you have uh, the Poromenga. And this is very interesting because uh, people will always talk to you. This identity category is very, much present, but then no one will point you who a Pormenga is because they think that its uh, characteristics are almost impossible to embody. And then of course there are the other uh, concepts. So it is these kinds of challenges uh, in terms of translating the concepts and the conception that uh, made me want to look at it in a way that is probably different from how uh, some uh, gender scholars who study in Western context might look at the whole concept of womanhood. Thank you. Yeah, we, it sounds like Ghana is even more challenging for translation in every single possible way. Mm -hmm. um, I can't even imagine concept, I can't even get my mind around 60 different languages, not just part of the country. So um, listen, we actually have um, a question for you. So we have the translation question, which is still up for grabs if you'd like to have a go at answering that. But um, we also have another question. Um, Sumi asks, I'd love to hear more uh, from you about embodied liberation. I actually teach the concept of the subaltern in a class that I teach on post-colonial and comparative political theory. So I'm gonna, the students seem really unhappy with it because it means it's something you can't see or it's something that you know is, should be there, but maybe isn't. Or, um, so I'm gonna use some of your um, examples and just sort of say, it'll always be there, but we have to work towards, um, we kind of work towards understanding it even if we know that we will never actually reach it. Um, I wanted to let, to let everybody know the Q and A box doesn't seem to be working but you all can ask questions in the chat directly. So please use the chat. Um, anyone from the audience who wants to ask our panelists questions, use the chat. And you have one question um, already from Catherine McKenzie. And she asks, she says, I'm really interested in what Constance is saying about language and concepts of womanhood. I am working on representations of adolescence, the words for children, Adolescence use in English carry so much social meaning it does not necessarily align with legal definitions of childhood. As an aside, this is actually really interesting to me because we think that, you know, academic language, which is, you know, anglophone, anglocentric, but even in English, we end up having these these these, these pieces of lived experience that are um, not glimpsed in academic, in certain kinds of words, in legal words, in, in academic language, et cetera. Um, so Catherine McKenzie continues. Also, especially in um, some of the fiction texts I am um, working with, there is an illusion of girlhood and womanhood, which makes material sense, but gain is not always recognized in law, including human rights law. I wonder if any of the panelists have a comment on expressions or representations of adolescent girl sub alternity. Does anybody want to have a, does anybody have a comment, maybe Constance, this seems like your wheelhouse. Right, okay, so it's quite interesting for me to hear this because uh, he's uh, working in the English language because uh, when I started to explore these uh, indigenous concepts and they faced a lot of challenges and sometimes I will uh, discuss with people 
uh, whose uh, understanding in the English language uh, is much stronger than mine, including other PhD uh, students who are native speakers. So for instance, for the concept of the Paul and um, I was struggling to find that um, the concept that will uh, bring this to life in the, 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 the written text, which is obviously in English. So I will describe to um, my um, native speaker colleagues uh, what the attributes of uh, this identity category is. And then someone said, what about willful? And then I said, yes, I think this is what um, will, uh, will, will uh, bring it um, to, to life. So in terms of law, obviously I'm not a legal person, but in terms of law in the English language, perhaps um, what um, this project, Catherine's project might also be interested in doing is then to uh, bring to light the, uh, perhaps the limitations of um, reading uh, legal languages in, uh, in English, even if you are writing in English and also the, the law is written in the English language. And I think that will uh, bring a, a different, it will bring this into a different focus because until now our focus have been how these dominant uh, languages uh, misrepresent or sometimes uh, misread uh, cultural practices and indigenous ideas that are other than the English language. Now you are writing the English language and you are faced with this challenge as well. So I find it really interesting. Thanks. Thanks. Um, do the other panelists want to weigh in? We, we do have another question, which we can go on to that, or you can weigh in on this one. No? Okay, so the next question we have, which is quite interesting, this is from Asia Banerjee. How can belonging to multiple disciplinary backgrounds, for example, or multiple, let me start that over. How can belonging to multiple disciplinary backgrounds, for example, social work and gender studies, confuse the language in which we could articulate patriarchy? <laughs> this is sort of the question from the opposite angle, rather than seeing it as translation of something liberating, something that's con confusing or a, a hindrance to um, articulating patriarchy. Go ahead, Aileen. So I have actually been thinking a lot about this, uh, coming from a gender studies background in the US myself, and I'm working in Argentina in our history. Um, and I think, Patriarchy is particularly one of these um, global north concepts uh, that I find very hard to use in my methods to think with it. Um, so I first think it's a historical. I know there's a lot of debate about this, but as a historian, you know, I'm interested in the nuances of the practices that happen in the moments in time that I'm looking at. Um, you know, how is it? I mean, most of my dissertation is actually about uh, women doing making art. So this is just kind of, kind of a subset of that. Um, so looking at the specific practices that that led to these women's um, erasure from our history and how they became marginalized in the art canon. But then again, I'm also thinking about you know the intersection with the sexuality. So this is how these these men come along, and I think patriarchy just doesn't really help me to think about how these things um, intersected and, and it's, it doesn't allow me to think. So I think really patriarchy is one of those big concepts in gender studies that um, might sometimes not be very helpful, particularly for historical research. That's actually really interesting. Elin, do you, have you found another word that you think is easier to think with or you know, more incisive, perhaps for your own, you haven't, oh, I know, it's hard to find, because hard it's to find also, these words, but it's, it's, it's also important to point out that not all of these words fit the context, right? Because it's very general, and I think that's the problem, like one looks, is looking, you know, on a page dissertation, something very specific, like these very general concepts um, are not always the best to use, like, to not really describe anything in the end. That's really interesting. Um, we've worked with this in my own work as well. I struggle with words like race. Like we're, you know, 17th century, like Sinophone literati elites racist. Like that's not a word that they use. But one of the reasons that people often use it 
knowing that it's anachronistic is because it enables certain kind of critical work to take place. So I'm wondering if we if we do away with a word like patriarchy, yes, it's, it's general, it's not specific enough, it's not gonna always fit our context, but I'm still wondering if it does an important kind of critical work that helps us link the struggles we're seeing in our in whatever we're examining to broader academic, but also socially activist languages, global languages. I, I, I'm not saying I have the answer, but it's something I, I also struggle with. I don't know if anyone wants to, to, to come back on that. So I, I just I wanted to add that um, I don't know about social work and gender studies, but in my uh, ethnography in Northern Ghana here, uh, when I presented part of my work uh, to a UK um, group, so um, someone suggested to me to qualify this extreme form of uh, male control that is pervasive in uh, the uh, northern part of Ghana. And she actually suggested to me to use hyper patriarchy or just to underscore that it is not just the general patriarchy that we are talking about, but it is patriarchy in its uh, extreme sense. So we actually have something in the world that's worse than patriarchy. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, not, such a, that's not such a great um, a message for feminism, but we're still fighting the, the, good, the good fight, I hope. Um, so, Aileen, go ahead. Yes, um, just thinking about what you say, for me, something that I think about also a lot, because patriarchy is a concept that is used a lot in current activists in Argentina since 2015, there's been a huge feminist movement. And so this is a concept that is used in everyday language. It's not only an academic concept. Um, and, and, you know, I struggle thinking about it. I, I have come to agree with myself that the aim of my research has a lot to do with kind of um, recovering and telling the stories of women in the past and their contributions to culture, at least in Argentina, but a little bit in regionally. Um, it does that have to do with dismantle patriarchy? I don't know. Uh, so perhaps thinking more humbly is a little bit of the of how I think about it. I don't know. <laughs> um, I should also note, so Humeta actually deputized me to answer questions on her behalf. Although I've, I've done none of the ethnographic work she has done, but um, she and I often speak, um, we're, we're I guess we're, we're, we're sort of involved in a movement within our very narrow parochial subfield called political theory. The movement's called comparative political theory. And the idea is like, how do we, how do we make political thinking more global in our discipline? Um, and we struggle with the same, the same kinds of concepts, like words like decolonization. I'm not even sure that's appropriate for the, for the, you know, the Sinophone or certain parts of the Sinophone context or even the East Asian context. Um, but is it still doing important critical work? How do we translate these words? Are there indigenous terms or categories or projects that were named by something that we could call imperial or colonial? So, I mean, I, I, I appreciate the very hard work that goes into thinking these categories. And I think if she met her were here, um, she, would, she would probably have some examples of her own um, to add because she's talking about Hawk, right? Where she says, well, it does mean rights and it does some of that work, but it does also more work. And we can't just say, we know what's going on or that we have a translation of this term without the context as Usma was explaining to us, right? Like that you have to understand like what is the, the context, the temporal context, the cultural context, the linguistic context, the disciplinary context even, right? Like, um, so I, I, I think she'd probably be sad that she's missing this conversation. I'm sure she would have, um, she would have a lot to add to it. Thank you, Usma, that was a very rich uh, response. We have about one minute left. I don't know if anyone would like to make any final comments If that's the case, we are officially at the end of time. Um, let me thank all of you for participating. I learned so much today. It was a lot of fun. It was very, um, I think, very enriching and very illuminating for me, and I hope uh, for the for our audience members uh, as well. Um, uh, thank you, and enjoy the rest of the conference.